As a monk, Luther devoted himself to a rigorous kind of austerity. He set out to be the perfect monk. He fasted for days and indulged in severe forms of self-flagellation. He went beyond the rules of the monastery in matters of self-denial. His prayer vigils were longer than anyone else's. He refused the normal allotment of blankets and almost froze to death. He punished his body so severely that he later commented it was in the monk's cell that he did permanent damage to his digestive system. He wrote about his experience. I was a good monk, and I kept the rule of my order so strictly that I may say that if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it was I. All my brothers in the monastery who knew me will bear me out. If I had kept on any longer, I should have killed myself with vigils, prayers, reading, and other work. Perfectly imperfect. Creed. Next. On So What? You gotta get it out, but the more you get out, the more it keeps coming in. And then the barcode reader breaks, and it publishes clearing house down. Hello, Newman. Hello, Newman. I'm Chris Dorman. Hello, Dorman. Hello, wait. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome back to So What. This oh, is Don man. Wait. By oh, by the, the way. way. Yeah, that's me. That's me. <laughs> we are continuing our series on the Apostles' Creed. And as you know, we've spent the last few podcasts looking at the ascension of Christ. And I hope you are as excited about what we have learned together as we are at the things that we have seen by deeply pondering yeah. Christ's ascension and all the good that comes to us from that. I mean, I got to tell you, there's there's so much, Chris, that we have looked at that honestly, I just had never really contemplated before. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say that, again, I would n not look at this creed the same way ever again. Yeah. Okay. And I also wouldn't look at the gospel the same way again. I mean, he really is sanctifying us, I believe, in how we see what Jesus mm -hmm. has done for us and who he is. And uh, even what we're getting into today, while it may not be groundbreaking from my own <laughs> mind in terms of the theology of it, it's just a great reminder of the depth of the love of Christ and what yeah, Jesus amen. did for us. Amen. So amen. The, the, the creed says he ascended and then he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Yeah. Okay, the, sit, Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father is a, is, a, is a continual refrain that you'll hear throughout the New Testament. In fact, in the very first sermon in Acts chapter two, Peter was preaching the fact that Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of the Father, okay? And, and what are the implications of that? That's what we wanna look at over the next couple of podcasts. Wow. Okay, so we started this. We started this uh, podcast. Don was reading a quote from uh, R.C. Sproul's book, *The Holiness of God*. It's a chapter called *The Insanity of Luther*. He's describing yeah. how Luther used to punish himself in in very very severe ways, and it's not an exaggeration that Martin Luther almost killed himself by the damage he did to his body. Yeah. Why? Why was he compelled? He felt compelled to hurt himself. Oh to deny gosh. himself, to suffer. Are you asking me that I'm question? Asking you that oh question. man! Because here's the thing: so under the theology, under the belief system that this man had and had been raised in, what Jesus did was not sufficient. What Jesus did on the cross, Chris, was not sufficient. So that man still had work to do. And he took it serious. Yeah, Look, it, it bothered his conscience. Yeah. I mean, the reason he's saying that he went far beyond what his brothers in the monastery were doing is because by God's grace, honestly, he saw his sin for the wickedness that it was. He understood sin, exactly. Exactly. He almost killed himself because he understood the weight of his guilt before God. He was a lawyer by training. So he understood law and punish crime and punishment. He understood that. He understood that more than, than his contemporaries. And so he felt that, look, the only way I can be right with God 
is I have to be holy. And if I'm going to be holy, then my body has to be in submission and I must punish myself and I must go to the confession for hours and hours at a time. I must because my my heart and my mind are full of wicked thoughts. Man. And I must deal with them. If I don't, then then I may be I may be cast out or cut off from eternal life with Christ. Man. And there's a grace of God in that man's life, the right man at the right time in history, to, to take that man in his agony over the holiness of God in his own sin, yeah. to get him ready to hear the real gospel. Yeah, the just shall live by faith. Right, <laughs> that just absolutely broke heaven's, uh, you know, heaven open for him, and he could see the glory of God and the grace of Christ at the cross and begin to understand what we're looking at today. He understood that he was forgiven. He understood that he was, I mean, really, really forgiven. That he didn't have to punish himself. He didn't have to hurt himself. He didn't, he wasn't, he hadn't done it. He didn't deserve to be punished more right. because Christ bore all of the punishment for him. He understood actually, as Don said, the gospel for the first time and it changed the world. Of course, all of his friends said, hey, that's right, you got it right. <laughs> no, that's a whole other story. We talked about right. that dinner series on the Reformation. Reformation yeah, right. back in 2017. It was a while ago. So friends, but why are we talking about that now? Because beloved, whether you realize it or not, I think many of us find ourselves in that same trap. We don't really embrace the fact that we're forgiven. And we have this sense of guilt and and fear that if we don't yeah. perform in certain ways, that God somehow is going to remove his blessing from us. And, oh, man. and so we have to either preemptively punish ourselves or, or do our own form of penance, even though as good Protestants, we don't believe in that. But as a practical matter, we do. Right. We are, pra in many ways, we're practical Catholics. We really, really are. We do not believe in the grace of God. We really don't. Not in its full implications. Because, we don't live that way. There's that piece of our, our mind and our heart that's wrestling with this idea. Is, is what Jesus did really enough? Because yeah. we see this and we don't know what to do with it. But honestly, it's because we're not resting. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Resting in what Christ right. has already right. done. Yeah. And so what does that have to do with Christ being seated at the right hand of the Father? Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 11. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those, you, you, right who are being made holy. You by are, one. You by are one act, he has made you, you perfect. perfect. You are perfectly imperfect, right. right? By one sacrifice, he has made you perfect forever while you are being sanctified. So you're imperfect, right? You're being sanctified. You're progressively being made more like Christ. That's called sanctification, being made more holy. But he made you perfect. You are. You are positionally justified. Perfect. You are absolutely justified because of the word of saved. Jesus Christ. And this yes. is why Jesus could say, when, when he gave up his spirit, it is finished. Right. The work is done. And it bore itself out in his resurrection and then his ascension. And then the sitting. So why, why the sitting? Why is that important? Because the priest in the temple never sat down. That's right. Never sat down. The work was never done. Because right. there was always sin that had to be dealt with. Imagine. Imagine being a, uh, being a priest. What an right. honor it was in that day. But how... Can you imagine the monotony of it almost. It's hard to, to say it that way, but the constant repetition, the daily sacrifices that are prescribed in scripture in the book of Nehemiah. It just keeps coming and coming and coming. There's never a let up, it's relentless. Every day it piles up more and more and more and you gotta get it up and the more you get out, the more it keeps coming in. And then the barcode reader breaks and it's published, it's clearing out There's in other places. But, but but people just new sinners coming in every day saying, "Hey, here, please take this goat. I committed a sin. I need you. To, I need to offer the sacrifice." It would, it would never. It would start in the morning and end at night. It would go on every single yeah. day throughout their lives. Can like, you imagine it? Would you would think it could kind of make it kind of make it crazy? Kind of like this video again, right? 
It just keeps coming and coming and coming. There's never a let up. It's relentless. Every day it piles up more and more and more. And you've got to get it up. And the more you get out, the more it keeps coming in. And then the barcode reader breaks. And it's published. It's clearing out. Right. right. So we laugh at that. Right. But it's like, but you think about what what's in the mind of these guys. And, and then it, it maybe it even can help you understand a little bit more when God is coming to his people and saying, look, man, I want a broken and a contrite heart. It's not the sacrifice itself. There's something deeper that those represent. Right. And ultimately, it's not realized until we see it in Christ. And what the Hebrews writer is telling us is that it's all summed up in Christ. Exactly. Exactly. And beloved, we just don't believe it. And so if you read, do yourself a favor and spend some time this week in the book of Hebrews, read it yeah. several times. Because he, he mentions it in, in chapter chapter 1, chapter 7, chapter 8, and then again here in 10 and probably other places that Jesus sitting down Jesus sits and down. then the, the, the repetition of the sacrifices, how it was all the time, daily work, in and out, day and night, always the same thing. Imagine, imagine you, you're not a priest, you're a penitent Jew. You've been convicted of your sin and you go to the temple and you bring your sacrifice, okay? And as you leave, you see this long line of people with their goats and pigeons and whatever they have. Right. And then a couple of days later, you gotta go back. You gotta go back again and again and again. You're never, how could you ever feel clean? How could you ever feel, I mean, really believe that God was pleased with you? How could you have a sense of freedom from the guilt and the weight of your sin? That's what Martin Luther felt. That's what the, I think a sincere penitent Jew would feel. Relief for that moment as that sacrifice is being offered and then cursing out his children on the way back home, realizing, oh my gosh, what have I done? I gotta right. go back tomorrow. Right. And this, and this I'm again, never clean. And this is what God does with the Mosaic Code, with the law. And this is what Paul says the purpose of the law is in our lives is to show us our need for Jesus, yeah. that we can't do it, that we all, it is too much, that there's nothing I can do, that I'm absolutely helpless, I'm destitute, I can't bring anything. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs and only theirs is the kingdom of Right, heaven. so he makes me poor and I realize I've got to go. I've got to come to Jesus. I've got to go to that old rugged cross. And then, but here's the, here's the thing that we got to keep in mind. This is why this is important. Jesus rising again, ascending to the heavens, seated at the right hand of the Father, what he's showing us and what he's communicating in the sitting is that it is done, that, the, that he is resting from the redemptive work. You and I don't have anything else. We can, oh, I can't contribute anything to Nothing. it. I've already contributed what I can. That's, it's my sin. That's it's my brokenness. He did the work. Exactly. The, the point of this message, beloved, is that you're, is that you're forgiven. <laughs> now, that may be a shocking message to us believers, but we do we really, we say we believe it, but do we trust it? Yes. I mean, seriously, do right. we trust it? Our last podcast series from as far as the East is from the West was all about what God has done through Christ with our sin. And that it was all about the fact that we're forgiven right. because we don't believe that. And beloved, here in, in, in this part of the creed, seated at the right hand of the Father, it's communicating to us that the work of, the punishment of your sin is yeah. done. It is over. And the work is finished. That's why he's sitting down. There's nothing more redemptively he needs to do. You're saved. You are secure. You are forever his. He always looks upon you with great favor. Despite your ongoing battle with sin, he loves you. He loves you. He cherishes you. You are bathed in the blood of the lamb and you are therefore white as snow. Amen. To believe that, beloved. The freedom to the freedom that gives us. Then we don't serve Christ out of guilt and out of fear. We serve him because we love him. We Amen. don't battle against sin because we're afraid of what's going to happen. We battle against sin out of gratitude for what he's done. And there's no pressure in that. Right. And then there's power in that. Yes. Right? Because power. it's not about my, yes. about my effort. Yes. It's about the effort that Jesus already did. His yes. energy was already expended. His yes. his work is done. And so we lean on that and we say, you know what, guess what? In my darkest moment, I'm reminded of that and I can say to my own soul, rest. Mm -hmm. Rest in Jesus. And when the enemy's arrows are attacking, I can say, you know what? It's not about me. My Savior did that for me. My Savior did that for me. Amen. Amen. <sighs> <sighs> to believe that. 
to really believe that, beloved, will change your life. I pray That's the gospel, gospel, man. That is a gospel. You're forgiven. Believe it. Uh, thank you for tuning in, my friends. And God willing, I'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. We'll see you real soon.